rising. Let's go. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Um, it was kind of a big surprise to me when uh, some of our students at Iowa State came in my office and kind of discovered that I'd done this work in Thorium. And I should give you a little bit of background on myself. I've been a board of directors member of the American Nuclear Society for six years. Taught at MIT in the nuclear engineering department. In fact, I got my PhD over here at that little school, Stanford. In mechanical engineering back in 1978, I was probably the last PhD in the nuclear field. And my doctoral work was on sponsored by the Electric Power Research Institute, EPRI, right around the corner. And it was on recycling plutonium and light water reactors and then LMFBRs. So that time, actually I'm an expert on risk assessment. I'm a nuclear safety expert. And so after I left uh, Stanford, I taught at MIT under Norman C. Rasmussen. Uh, who was the chair of the nuclear engineering department at MIT and the father of the WASH 1400 reactor safety study. So most of my career has been on reactor safety for light water reactors. And it really wasn't until uh, 2008 when I went on sabbatical at General Atomic in San Diego that I got involved with thorium. <laughs> and uh, so I'm gonna, t most of my slides are from that work. And now I also want to introduce Dr. Ram Sharma. He is not an engineer, he's a poet, he's a writer, he's a professor of English. But he is a passionate environmentalist and um, he is involved with a World Peace Center uh, after Mahatma Gandhi in the greater Delhi area. And together we have been speaking at many colleges of engineering and business and other fields in India. Uh, we're passionate about saving the environment. We're passionate about the problems with global warming. We went up to uh, visit the Himalayan mountains. In fact, I will be in India for three months. This summer we'll return to the Himalayas. You'll be surprised to hear that in June we were up and saw no snow up at the highest peaks. So the Ganges River system in India is in peril. As we know, there's a drought in California and there are major weather events occurring all over the world. So global climate change is an issue. Now when uh, John was talking about Al Gore, <laughs> uh, we happened to be at a global climate change conference in February. Uh, in India, in Gwalior, which is about, for those of you unfamiliar with India, you may have heard of the Taj Mahal. The Taj Mahal is located in Agra. And it's about, what, a three hour train ride down from Delhi. An hour south of Agra is Gwalior, which is another major Indian city. There they have a private university of science and technology and the Indian government has been sponsoring conferences on climate change. And um, we've been at that conference three times. December 2010 was the first. And that's when I uh, presented my paper on thorium. Now how did I even get invited to that conference? Well, in my first trip to India was in August of 2010. I went as a guest of one of my engineer, one of my Indian students at Iowa State, and he actually arranged for me to give talks about thorium around India at some of the most major engineering colleges. So, uh, in August of 2010, I gave a talk at the MIT of India, which is IIT Mumbai, as a guest of the nuclear engineering people. Now, who showed up at my thorium talk there but the Babha Atomic Research Center people? Now, as you may know, Dr. Baba, who the Atomic Research Center of India is named after, is really the father of the thorium program in India. So they were very nice after my talk. A couple of the nuclear engineering professors there showed me some of their research there, and it's part of their thorium program. Uh, so let's fast forward now to February 
2012. We're back at the Global Climate Conference in Gwalior, and the World Nuclear Association has its first nuclear conference ever in Delhi. So I'm able to attend that because that was the end of February. When I was at that conference, they had a dais, a head table, five nuclear uh, scientists who lead the various Indian nuclear research centers were speaking on nuclear power. Every single one of them talked only about thorium. It wasn't like they're talking about uranium and then mention thorium. Now as a former board member of the American Nuclear Society, I can tell you that at all of those numerous conferences at ANS I've been to and helped organize, we never once talked about thorium because our country decided a long time ago that we were going with the uranium-plutonium fuel cycle. And thorium was left behind. So even at MIT in the nuclear engineering department, our students never hear about it, which is, you know, a crying shame. But India, on the other hand, has been, uh, because of the thorium resources in India and various other reasons, consistent in their path. So I'm here today to talk a little bit about that. So I'm gonna go, first of all, Dr. Ram is going to recite, he's passed around some of his poetry. He's agreed to recite a couple poems which have to do with his passion about uh, saving the world and all of those things. Go ahead. Namaste to all. It's my pleasure to speak among the galaxy of nuclear scientists. We have been working together on Ganges. We have been up to the Badrina. And I tell, I'm telling you about energy. Our government were uh, making 15 hydraulic power plants four years ago. Then we decided to oppose this policy and now we have a new government from last year. So this government is very much pro thorium active. We have written letters, we have done demonstrations. So now they are making new policies about uh, nuclear power plants and uh, they are going to release it very soon. I am going to recite uh, my first poem, Life's Clarion Call to Save the World. What is Life's Clarion Call? save the world. When dawn scatters the golden pulse of life, when night sings the lovely songs of love, the conscious dances into the deep blue of the sky, the light of energy laughs inside heart's greenery. Then all the dreams of life will awaken where the dark clouds once hovered all around and the sea howls within its uncontrollable waves where the storms have come without any direction. Here our life's swan song resumes its singing. Inside of love, we are living life's clarion call. Second poem is directionless. We are all ever directionless and we do not really know anything at all. When did we laugh from within hearts last? All are engulfed inside of mundane glitters. We are unknown even to ourselves. We are all ever alone here now. But do not worry so much. We have to go on searching for that which is eternal. And that is, that is so great. Love is all powerful. And we have come to give love. We have only come here to spread this love. So wide, very vast, so deep. And the third small poem. World will change with your love. The dark night will disappear with an glittering dawn. The world will change with your love. Open all our eyes with positivity. The ferocious strong will change into a cool breeze. The flowers of feeling will open and blossom. 
the vines of love will ever grow strong consciousness of prayer shines upon the darkness of night the dark night will disappear with a glittering dawn the world will laugh will change with your laugh thank you i'm on the handing over to karun okay so unlike um climate change conferences that might have been held here in the US. Not only do Indians react in a very positive way toward nuclear power, but of course thorium is viewed as we view it here in this room. So some of the people mentioned they go to Washington or in Denmark, the politicians aren't listening, but in India that's not the case. Uh, at a government conference at the Taj, all of those nuclear scientists up there at the World Nuclear Association Conference talked only and mainly about thorium. So there is at least one country on the earth, and it's India, that has seen the light and has been seeing the light. So um, I'm just going to start going through then what I have here. Is, so when I was at GA, I found um, this article on thorium power that was in the Cosmos Australian Science Magazine. And I really liked it. They had a flower nuclear symbol and they thought of thorium power as green nuclear power. And I think all of you already agree with that, but I, if you haven't seen that flower nuclear symbol, uh, here it is and it's thorium. And. Uh, what I would conclude with actually in my talks is that the future is bright for thorium fuels because uh, even though India is particularly the one leading a lot of this, as we've heard today, there's many collaborations being established. Um, we heard the speaker from Denmark with his new company collaborating with the Czechs. And there are many different um, organizations that are now working on that and these are showing Actually, that slide is showing the nuclear plants around the world. So I had a slide that I came up with with the industrial experience of thorium. And unfortunately, the only country on that list that still has any thorium reactor in operation is in India. Now, if you really want an update on what's going on with thorium in India, I happen to come across, go on YouTube and look up the TED Talk from CERN. And there's uh, one of the leading Indian nuclear scientists talks about what's going on with thorium in India and invites everyone down to southern India to visit one of their thorium-based reactors. Now, uh, I should mention when I was on the board of directors of ANS, we tried, I was also on our international committee, and we tried to have collaborations with India. But at that time, our government uh, really did not want to or permit us to do much with India because they, India had not signed the Non-Proliferation Treaty. So at that time, uh, that was a barrier. <laughs> um, and so it's only been very recently in the last few years uh, that the ties between India and US, at least on the nuclear side, have started to warm up. And of course, you probably all have heard about this nuclear deal that keeps being discussed with India. President Obama was there with the new Prime Minister, Mr. Modi, uh, in February, about a week or two before we arrived for our conference. And so that has nothing to do with thorium. That has to do with their light water reactors. But uh, there is now at least um, kind of an opening emerging. Uh, you have to admit that the Indians have not been forthcoming, and why should they be? Uh, why should they be open to what they're doing with their thorium program? And um, so it has, in a way, it's been difficult to really find out details, but clearly if you look at this list, uh, they have the greatest experience, and they're continuing to do that. Um, there, there's no sign that they're not going to, to, do, to continue. In fact, with, I would ask Dr. Sharma to comment on Mr. Modi, the new prime minister. I presume Mr. Modi will even be more <laughs> of a strong supporter of the thorium nuclear program. And if anyone disagrees with me, let me know. But 
I think that's probably the case. So I'm going to talk a little bit in the last couple minutes about, um, I don't know how many of you have ever heard of thorium symbiosis. Have any of you heard about that? So I thought I might talk about that in this group if you haven't heard about it. It's an idea that uh, Jim Lorimore came up with who worked at GA and then went on to the IAEA. And while he was at the IAEA, he promoted this. Um, and this is not a new thing. It was September 1982 that he was working on a GA product, uh, project. And this has to do with how you could uh, utilize thor thorium on a global level. And of course, uh, he talks about the first stage being the deployment of LWRs on a once through fuel cycle, which is unfortunately where we're still at in this country. And that's with the current fleet of generation two reactors on our UPU fuel cycle. Well then, he envisioned way back in 82, the second stage where you would have large numbers of advanced converters utilizing thorium and they would be installed after the year 2020. The advanced converters initially operate on relatively efficient once through fuel cycles. Operation at high conversion ratios is introduced as U233 becomes available from recycle and production at high conversion ratios is introduced. Then advanced converters, um, and at that time the NGMP program was underway, um, a very high temperature reactor and those, there are many alternatives, become the dominant reactor type as LWRs are retired. So this was an idea he had back in 82 as how you would phase out LWRs and bring in these high temperature reactors uh, and you would be using the thorium fuel cycle. So they would remain so during the transition to a long-term symbiotic system with about three advanced converters per fast breeder reactor. And then in the third stage, U233 is introduced into the blankets of fast breeders, such as the NGMP SFR that was being developed at INEL. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up with regard to India is actually India has, when you look at their plans, really got this same kind of idea in mind because they're actually operating, uh, you know, uranium fuel cycle power reactors. But in their latter stages, they're going to do this. This was something, though, that Jim Lorimar or, uh, discussed and studied at GA. And he, while he was at the IAEA, he developed the idea of an international thorium symbiosis on an international scale it would be attractive and offers economies of scale. And an example of a possible international nuclear cooperation arrangement based on thorium symbiosis is as follows. Multinational cooperation is established between an industrialized country or countries with a large nuclear power program and several associated countries whose installed nuclear capabilities or capacities are smaller than 30 to 50 gigawatt. And so the industrialized country hosts the fuel cycle centers with facilities for spent fuel storage reprocessing, conversion, and recycle fuel fabrication. And then the smaller countries would be sending their fuel back. Thorium fuel from the SFR blankets is reprocessed along with thorium containing fuel from advanced converters. So this whole idea would be uh, the way that we could go on an international level. And um, if you haven't heard about that, I just wanted to bring that up. And I believe that in a sense, the Indians are going after this. They're also considering exporting their technology and selling it to other countries. And I know uh, John talks a little about the Chine Chinese. I don't know where China stands, but certainly India is continuing and they may be, in fact, what I'm guessing is they might be considering something like this. So I wanted to bring that to your attention. If you're not, if you haven't heard about thorium symbiosis, now you have. <laughs> so I think that's where we're ending. Do you want to, you want to comment quickly? about India at all? About okay, Mr. Modi? Just a yeah. minute or two. 
Yeah. Mr. Modi, our new Prime Minister is uh, pro thorium and is uh, inviting uh, tenders for the power plants because earlier there were some tensions between uh, state government and central government because there were some misconceptions about nuclear power plants and now they are clearing it up and uh, so the future is the thorium energy. That's it. Thank you.